I want to be like Jesus. Good morning, everyone. It's so hard. We come here only once a week. Shouldn't we do this like every day? Yes. <laughs> that would be awesome. And then we'd be all hugged in and, you know, greeted up. Be good. Good to see so many of you here today. With all of the affairs going on in our world and all of the craziness going on, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize you as the great I am, the one who sits on the throne in heaven, the one who has power over all things. And yet, Lord, we are live in a fallen state, in a fallen world, and evil is here. I pray, God, that you might help each one of us, Lord, to be submitted in our hearts to you, that we might be faithful in prayer for the people in the Ukraine, for the condition of our world, and for what the future looks like. We know, Lord Jesus, that you're coming back soon. I pray that you help us to be ready and waiting. As we look into your word today, Lord, I pray that you would, by your Holy Spirit, sift through our hearts and help us to align ourselves with you. We need your help to do that, Lord. Pray for your spirit to fall upon us, Lord. That you might help us to be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are back in the book of Luke. We're going to go from verse 11 to 21. We're going to talk about thankfulness. Thankfulness. This is the... This is the event when Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and 10 lepers approach him. I don't know if you've ever been approached by even one leper, but 10 lepers approach Jesus and they cry out to him. And we're going to take a look at that because I think there's a lot for us to look at that maybe we don't know. And uh, I'm just taking the possibility that maybe you don't know everything. I know I've learned some things going through the scripture and I'll just share with you the things that I've learned. Last week, we talked about what it is to live in the kingdom of God. We talked about mustard seeds. We talked about sycamore trees being thrown in the ocean. We talked about mountains being removed. All of this talking about how we should forgive one another and how we should confront one another. We went to Matthew 18 and talked about if someone sins against you, you go to them and you resolve it and you confess and you do whatever you have to do to bring reconciliation. But if that process doesn't happen, then restoration can't happen because it's all kind of bottled up. <clears throat> Any of you tend to be like bottler uppers? Yeah. Stuff bothers you and you just bottle it up. Well, that's not a good practice. It's not healthy. And we talked about it last week. Uh, the passage that I was thinking of last week that I didn't have on the slide is Micah 9, uh, 7, 19, which is, he will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. That's what Jesus has done by coming and being a sacrifice for us. Our sins are as if they were cast into the deepest part of the ocean. And th that's what we're supposed to have faith against is this root of bitterness that grows up in our heart. And we talked about that last week. We talked about how our life is not about us, it's about serving the Lord. Sometimes <clears throat> we can live our lives going from one thing to the next thing to the next thing and looking at our schedules and being on our phones and checking the news and making phone calls and, and we can be so busy that we forget really what our life is about. It's about living for the Lord. <clears throat> Are any of you like me, just in the middle of the day, you're, you're in the middle of some task and you remember, oh yeah, you're here. You're here, Lord. I get myself so wrapped up in projects sometimes, and it's usually when I'm working with my hands, and I have to just stop and say, wow, you're here. Something maybe you want to say to me? Because <laughs> I think I got distracted. And that happens a lot. How about you? You just get so into what you're doing to accomplish it, and then you forget really who you are and whose you are, and that he's with you. Our life is not about us. It's about him. 
And when we do that and we understand that we live first for the kingdom of God, then our life has purpose, it has meaning, it has direction, it has depth. And then the things that would otherwise be like giant backpacks on our back weighing us down just aren't because they're much smaller than who God is and his presence. So we're going to go from verses 11 to 21. At verse 18 says, were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Let's read, the, let's read what happened. In verse 11, chapter 17 of Luke, it says, Now it happened, as he, Jesus, went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourself to the priest. And so it was that they went and they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice, glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. It's an interesting passage, so let's uh, just take it apart. In verse 11, it happened as they went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Now, really strict Jews would not go through Samaria. Samaria was a group of mixed people. They were Jewish and Babylonian in nature uh, because Babylon had come in and taken them over and uh, seated their own people in that land. And so they were somewhat mixed. They had their own set of beliefs of what they believed about the scriptures. So they weren't orthodox. They were way on the liberal side and they were of a mixed race. And so the Jews always looked down on them. And so he's going, or he's skirting actually between Samaria and Galilee, going through the middle of that area and approaches him 10 lepers, <clears throat> 10 lepers who stood afar off and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. It's amazing that these lepers knew who to go to. They went to Jesus. This group of people probably was a mixture of Samaritans and Jews. So there's this mixed group of people together consenting to live with each other. And you would think that these two groups, because they're always arguing with each other, that they wouldn't be in the same group. And yet Jesus is going through this area and there's this mixed group of 10 men who are lepers who are living together. They're not all Jews. There's Samaritans and Jews. And we know this because one of them comes back who's a Samaritan. And Jesus tells them to go to the temple and show themselves to the priest. He would never do that if they were all Samaritans. So there's this mixed group. I find these 10 lepers are kind of representative of me. Leprosy was always a symbol of sin throughout the Old Testament. And it's one of the only things that you go into the temple and you get cleansed of. It's, it's a rather interesting thing. You don't get healed of it. You get cleansed of it, which is rather interesting. It's the same word they talk about sin being cleansed. And so it's, it's one of the only maladies that's mentioned that way, which is kind of interesting. But there's 10 of them. It doesn't matter who you are. <clears throat> But this desperation that they have because of their terminal condition has brought a deep sincerity. Do you find that desperate situations tend to 
bring a sincerity and a clarity of what's important to you? I was having breakfast the other morning <clears throat> and I felt bad. I felt bad that I was having a good healthy breakfast free of invasion into New Jersey without bombs and my electricity's on and I felt guilty. Desperate times have a way of bringing everything in focus. This desperation brought a sincerity on behalf of these men and they knew where to go, and they went to Jesus. Even though they were this mixed group of people, there was a unity among them because they all suffered from the same malady. And suddenly, their theological differences and their perspectives, and maybe even where they came from, all, maybe their skin color, all of that didn't matter because they all had the same disease. They had leprosy. And what they had more in common was bigger than what their differences were. You know what that's like? <clears throat> uh, look around you. <laughs> Wherever it is that we've come from, what we have in common is that we all have a terminal disease. It's called sin. And Jesus Christ has become our savior. And that is the biggest commonality that overcomes all other barriers. Amen? Amen. And that's the way it was for these guys as they approached Jesus. They knew who he was and they called him master. They knew that he was in control. They knew that they could pray to him and he would answer their prayers. They knew that he was in control, regardless of what was going on in their body. Leprosy or what's called Hansen's disease is just one of many things that is denoted in scripture as a skin disease. And it's not something that's just a skin disease. It's actually below the surface. It just kind of shows itself. It will kill your nerve endings to the point where you have no feeling. And you'll cut yourself and not know it. And then you'll get infections prone to it. And then parts of your body begin to disappear. Uh, it tends to harbor into the cooler places of your body, your toes, your fingers, your nose, your ears, the fleshy parts that aren't as close to the heart, that aren't as warm. Uh, it tends to thrive in that. Actually, if, uh, if you're an armadillo, you really have problems because they're especially susceptible to Hansen's disease because their body temperature is cooler. But sorry, I read too much online. <clears throat> so these men have this terminal disease. There was no cure for leprosy. Now there is. Uh, actually, they don't, they don't cure it. They actually keep it at bay. Um, and one of the elements of that medication is actually common aspirin. It's kind of, anyway. So they go to Jesus and call him master because they know that he can do something about it. And their cry is interesting. Jesus, master. Now, they, it's the first time they're meeting him and calling him master. That's a rather interesting concept. That's like, hi, what's your name? I'd like to marry you. That would be a bit abrupt, wouldn't you think? They call him master because they knew who he was. They had faith in who he was. And they said, have mercy on us. Mercy on us. Why would Jesus be able to have mercy on them? Because Jesus is the king of the universe, the creator of all things. All things were created by him and for him and through him are all things. That's why. Because he can do it. And so they went to the right guy and they knew what to call him, and they knew what he could do. And he asked for mercy. Mercy is God withholding that which we deserve, which we've earned, which would be judgment. And they were bearing it in the form of leprosy. So, been there and done that? I would hope every single one of you at some point realized that you were a sinner. God, I am sick with this terminal disease that will ultimately take my life called sin. And sin leads to death. Right. Every sin leads to death. And I'm an addict to sin. Name your poison. There was a day I came before Jesus and I said, I know that I'm a sinner. I need to be forgiven. And I know the only way I can be forgiven is if someone perfect were to come and take my place. And that was Jesus. 
Jesus came in the perfect sacrifice for my sin, and he said it over and over and over again. There is no other way to the Father but through Jesus. How many of you glad you know Jesus? We got so many more than 10 lepers here. <clears throat> so when he saw them, Jesus said to them, go show yourself to the priests. What? <laughs> if somebody came up to me and said, Pastor Dave, listen, I have some questions. And I say, go to McDonald's. <laughs> that would seem callous, wouldn't it? And yet we read through the scriptures and we see something like this and we go, I imagine what the lepers are thinking, like, wait a minute. We remember all the way back in Luke chapter 5, we remember Jesus, the, a leper came up to Jesus and he laid hands on him, which, by the way, you, they were at a distance because they were lepers and that's what they're supposed to do. They had to say, unclean, unclean, if they were upwind and there was distances they had to keep. And the Old Testament is rife with all sorts of regulations on these folks. And they were to be outside the camp. They weren't supposed to be in the city. You weren't supposed to be around people. There was no intimacy whatsoever. There was no touching. There was nothing. Because that's what sin does. It alienates us. It puts us outside fellowship. And he says, go show yourself to the priests. Now, unless you were a good Jew and you understood what in the world that meant, in Leviticus 13 and 14, it's an extensive piece of scripture that talks about leprosy. And what you're to do if you are cleansed of leprosy, which it was a terminal disease, nobody got cleansed of it. But there are two entire chapters dedicated to the priests who acted as kind of uh, the common doctor or your, your MD, because they would check you out, make sure it was what it was, if there was a white hair in it. There's, you got to look at it, guys. It's very, very detailed. And if it's something that comes from beneath the skin or whether it's just temporary or whether it's a scar or whether it's a bright red spot, there's all of this, if, if, you, if, if you're up for the challenge, check it out. Chapter 13 and 14. So they come up to Jesus and he says, go show yourself to the priest. Well, they would have to go into town and they would have to show themselves to the priest. And I'm sure they're thinking, wait a minute, there was a guy. I heard that Jesus healed and he laid his hands on him which it's amazing that none of the leprosy got on Jesus, but a lot of Jesus got into the leper. I hope that you guys are all the same way, that Jesus has filled you with the Holy Spirit enough that you're affecting other people, that they're not affecting you. In Luke chapter five, we see the story, and it happened that as he went to a certain city, and behold, a man who was full of leprosy, that's bad news, that's head to toe saw Jesus and he fell on his face and implored him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Do you see the faith? And he put out his hand, Jesus did, and touched him saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him and he charged him not to, te to tell no one, but to go and show himself to the priest. There it is again. And make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. When Jesus walked the earth and all of these folks came and he was boom, 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 healing them, he sent them right to the priest. Imagine the priest. He, he sees a leper coming. He goes, oh, that's Stephen. He's got, he's got leprosy. What's he coming here? Wait a minute. He looks pretty good. Maybe he's on a diet. You've been working out. Wait a minute. You don't have leprosy anymore. Yeah, I know. The one who healed me told me to come, and here's my sacrifice. He's bringing two birds. He's bringing two lambs. There's a sacrifice that's to be made, and it's very, very involved. So Jesus is sending all these people to the priest. The priests are like, you're clean. And they declare them clean publicly and suddenly they're accepted into society again and they can go home to their wives and their children and their lives have been completely changed as a testimony to the priests. Jesus did this for the people, but he also did it as a testimony to the priests. Many more of them should have believed instead of fighting him. So... This is Leviticus 14, just to give you just a, a small flavor. So hang tight, guys. It's going to be a little like Bible college for a minute. 
Then the priest shall command and take for him who is to be cleansed two living and clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel running over with water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood, and the scarlet, and the hyssop, and dip them in the, the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. You got this? Memorize this recipe, okay? <laughs> and he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from leprosy and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. But that's not all. <clears throat> what in the world is going on here? I got two birds, okay, one of them's going to die. He's going to be in an earthen vessel, so that's where he's going to die. And it's, there's the running water that's there, and there's the hyssop, and then there's scarlet. Scarlet's a color. What, what, what is that? Any of you confused? None of you. Oh, that's good. Well, I'll just move on. You know what the amazing thing about this is? Jesus on every page in the Old Testament. The two birds speaks of the two natures of Jesus. One, that he was a man and he was sacrificed. One, that he was God and that he rose. The earthen vessel represents the tomb that he was put in. On and on and on. Cedar was probably what the cross was made out of. Listen, there's all these things, and I don't want to get into it because I don't have time. You guys got to go. There's probably a football game or something going on. But all of these things are deeply emblematic of Jesus, the, the, the crimson which actually is the off-scouring of a worm. And uh, it's a whole thing, guys. I, I don't want to get into it, but I'm compelled. So the hyssop is the way that it's applied. It's a rather interesting thing. So it's kind of like a sponge, okay? So you've got these two birds. It's going to be killed in an earthen vessel. One's going to be let go. There's blood involved. There's water, which is, means that there's a sacrifice, and there's blood, which usually means that there's contamination, but because of the water, it's always clean. And see, Jesus died, and he was sinless, and that's a picture of that. So you have all of these things that come together. If you read through Leviticus and you're bored, just look for Jesus, and suddenly it will become all new for you. And it says, as they went... They were cleansed. You see, Jesus said, go to the priests before they were cleansed. Jesus didn't touch them. There was no abracadabra. There was no special, you know, Hamana should have bought a Honda. You know, there's none, nothing going on here. Jesus said, go to the priests. they had to turn around and go in faith. It says, as they went, they were healed. Don't you find that interesting? Jesus didn't heal them and then say, go to the priest like he did in Luke chapter five. He required of these 10 guys something a bit more. He said, go to the priest. Okay. So they turn and they go to the priest and as they went, they were cleansed. Can you imagine the conversation? I mean, usually the conversation among 10 men is centered around sports, politics, something of that nature. But as they're walking, they're becoming healed. They're becoming healed. And becoming healed, not just arrested. That means parts are coming back. Because that's what Jesus does. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32 says this. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, <clears throat> and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How many of you heard that last section before? You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. By the way, it's not just knowing the truth mentally. If you look at the previous verse, if you abide in me, if my word abides in you. In other words, if you do the things that I'm telling you to do, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free as you do those things that Jesus told you to do. Isn't that interesting? Yes. You want the blessings of God before you're willing to do what Jesus told you to do. It doesn't work that way. No. It's as we go, God blesses us. And it's as they go that they were healed. Amen? Amen. So it's a common thing. 
if you remember what happened at, with, when the Jews, they escaped. God set them free from Egypt and they were going through the wilderness. They were 38 years, they struggled in the wilderness. People rounded up to 40, it's close enough. So it's 38 years they go through the, they go through the wilderness and eventually they come to the Jordan. And now they have to cross the Jordan. Now, if you remember, when Moses parted the Red Sea, you know, dom, dom, da dom. You remember, Charlton Heston. <laughs> and God parted the sea, and there was a wind that blew all night, and it, they crossed over as in dry ground. And then when they got to the other side, and the chariots tried following them, you know, you old Brenner's boys covered in on you guys. Okay, sorry. I'm showing my age, I guess. But... After all of this wandering, they're up against the Jordan and they go to cross the Jordan and the Levites are carrying the Ark of the Covenant. They're, they're, they're ready to go and they're like, hey, we can't cross because there's water. The Lord tells Joshua, go ahead, it's okay. And you know, what are they thinking? What's he gonna, what are you gonna walk on water, all of us? We've got a lot of people here. And they walk on water. No. Joshua chapter 3, 14 to 16, till so it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan, that the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows its banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zeratan. And the waters then went down into the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, failed and were cut off, and the people crossed over the opposite to Jericho. God didn't do the miracle before they crossed over. He did it as they were crossing over. I see a principle here. Sometimes you have to get your feet wet <laughs> before God intervenes on your behalf. If you abide in my word, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You see, God doesn't always do something when you ask him to. Sometimes he's asking you to go in the direction of being obedient and then he does a miracle. You guys see that? I wonder how often God's wanted to do something more in my life, but I wasn't willing to take that step in that direction of being obedient. Sometimes I get lost up here. But I shall try to remember where I am. If you remember Jesus with the man by the pool of Bethesda, he had been there for 38 years. Gee, what a coincidence. He was in Solomon's colonnade. They had five columns there representing the five books of Moses or the law, if you will. And so he's sitting there under the law, sitting beside a pool that he would hope one day would get stirred by an angel and he'd be the first one in and he wouldn't be the rotten egg. He'd be the guy that got out and was healed because there was this fabled story that an angel would come up and stir the water and the first one in got healed. For 38 years, Jesus goes to him in Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Beth Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. That sounds coincidental. Then Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time and said to him, do you want to be made well? Interesting question. The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Did he answer the question? No. Do you want to be healed? You want to be made well? It's impossible. Can't happen. There's nobody to help me. I can't get there. Somebody gets there before me. Everybody's got it better than me. I always have it worse than everyone else. Everyone's against me. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Hey, do you want to be made well? Sorry, what was the question? 
Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Interesting conversation. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. And that begins the whole bomb, bomb, bomb. Oh no, Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Do you want to be made well? <laughs> it ain't going to happen, man. I've been sitting here for 38 years. You know what it is when you've been waiting on something for 38 years? My poor wife has been waiting for me to get my act together for 38 years. <laughs> she knows. But being unwell, being dropped at this place for 38 years, having hope somehow in this representation of the law that the law is going to save him or that some fabled angel's going to come down and take care of you. You know, there are a lot of people that put their faith in things that they shouldn't put their faith in. Mm -hmm. This guy didn't have any faith when Jesus found him. He healed him anyway. Don't you find that curious? Hey, do you want to be made well? It can't happen. Pick up your bed and walk. Jersey version. And he did. Imagine if he didn't. Jesus commanded him to do something. And his response was showing that he had faith. He didn't even make eye contact with Jesus because later they questioned, hey, who was the man? He goes, I don't know. I didn't see him. You didn't see the guy having a conversation? You ever have a conversation with a homeless person? They never make eye contact. I, I went to New York City this past week, and you, you see them on the street, and they'll put their hand out, they'll be talking to you without looking at you. That's kind of the way this guy was. I don't know who he was, but the guy who told me, told me to pick up my mat and walk, so I walked. Imagine that he didn't obey Jesus. Pick up your mat and walk. I just told you it's never going to happen. I just told you. I was just complaining and grumbling to you about this. Don't you understand? But you see, faith got mixed in there. And he tried. You know, God will honor that if you will take one step toward him. He will meet you. When Jesus says, rise, you should do it because you can. Rise up, take your bed and walk. I wonder, is Jesus saying that to any of you today? Is there some tree that's got its roots deep into your life? Is there some mountain that you feel is impossible to climb or get over or get around? This is right on the heels of Jesus teaching that. So is God directing you to do something amazing? You know, he looks for places where he can do amazing things for people that trust him. Amen. He looks for that still today. Getting back to our 10 lepers. They were healed as they went. An amazing principle right there. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned. And with a loud voice course, they're obnoxious, glorified God and fell down at his feet, giving him thanks. By the way, he thanked Jesus. And if Jesus wasn't the one to thank, don't you think he would have said something? Yeah. Don't thank me. Thank God. Yeah. Just want to show you Jesus receives worship and only God receives worship. Therefore, And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. He was one of these mixed people. Now, maybe the priest wouldn't even know who he was, and he had no business really going there. They had their own mountain. They had their own worship. They adhered to the scriptures they felt were pertinent to their lives, but then nothing else. He was a Samaritan. Now, imagine the Jews that are all following, including the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and they're all following Jesus, seeing all of this. And this guy's a Samaritan. It's kind of a smack in their face. And Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? Are there not any found and returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? 
Jesus makes a statement to the crowd. Isn't, what happened to the nine? What happened to the nine? Well, they were just doing what Jesus told them to do. They are going to the priest. What's the big deal? This guy turned around and he happened to be a Samaritan. He really had no place at the temple and before the priest. And so instead of going to the priest, he became a priest. A priest is one who intermediates between man and God. And he took up the mantle that day and became a priest. A new heart that has been set free from sin is characteristically a worshiping heart. Amen? Amen. When you know that you've had a fatal disease, that sin was going to send you straight to hell, and you deserve God's judgment, and you deserve a cold, long eternity separated from God, when you know that you've earned that, and Jesus took that away from you and gave you eternal life and a loving relationship with a heavenly Father who wants to walk with you and talk with you and tell you that you are his own, does that not produce a thankful heart? Do you not want to be loud about it? Does it make you want to fall down? So what do you think the most thankful people are? What do you think? The most thankful people. In the story, lepers. <laughs> lepers that are cleansed are the most thankful people. They were looking at a death sentence. So how many of you were lepers? How, how's your joy meter? <laughs> Listen, I, I, things could have gotten much worse for me. I'm a ticking time bomb. One day I'm going to die of something. There's something crawling around under my skin right now. I just know it. <laughs> but other than being raptured, that's the only way I'm going to meet the Lord is to depart from this yep. body. When you've been cleansed of a fatal condition and you're delivered in a moment because you simply believe Jesus, that should produce a thankful heart. We above all people on the face of this planet should be thankful. And it's funny, we, we don't tend to get it until we start to watch the news and see what's going on in the Ukraine and imagine ourselves there and if you have friends or relatives over there, you begin to look at your life and become very thankful. Not just for eternity and everything that God's given, but how easy he makes it for us to be able to come to church, a comfortable chair, ambient temperatures, coffee and food when we're done. Brothers and sisters that are sincere and have real love. Boy, we have so much to be thankful for. Good. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, for it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. <clears throat> like leprosy, there is nothing any of these men could do about their condition. There's nothing the priest could do about their condition. Only Jesus could deal with that condition. And only Jesus can deal with our condition. The once and done being birthed into the kingdom of God. Oh, by the way, Leviticus, interesting, 13 and 14. It's just the beginning with the birds and the, and the earthen vessel and the red and the cedar and all of the water and all of that. That's just the beginning. Because after that, you have to shave your entire body. Your head gets shaved, your eyebrows get shaved, all the hair in your body gets shaved as the priest checks you out from top to bottom like a doctor might. And he proclaims you new and clean like a baby. That's exactly what you look like too, with no hair. <laughs> it's a born again experience right in the Old Testament, boys and girls. Amen? Amen. And after that, there's two lambs. You've got to have a burnt offering and a trespass offering, and then you have to sacrifice that. And the priest takes the blood, and he puts it on your right earlobe and on your right thumb and on your right big toe. And then he takes oil, and he pours it in his left hand, and it actually says left hand. And then he dips his finger in seven times into the oil, and he puts it on your earlobe and on your thumb and on your big toe. I'm going to leave that a secret. 
Because we're running out of time. When God makes you clean, he sanctifies your ears. He sanctifies your hands, which represent what you do. He sanctifies where you go, which is represented by your feet. It's deeper than that, but that's the quick and easy for the moaners. These guys are clean. They're going to have all the hair shaved off their body, a born-again experience, and there's going to be all this sacrifice that goes on, and they're going to be accepted back into their homes. And isn't that what happens when Jesus comes into our lives? Yes. Amen. Beware of a thank, thankless heart, like the nine, because there were ten, right? And only one returned. One felt so overwhelmed to come back and give worship and praise to God. A thankless heart is one of those very dangerous things, and you should take it seriously like a heart attack. Romans chapter 1, verses 20 and 22 for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, these are God's invisible attributes, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. People should know that there's a designer because everything has been designed. From a giraffe to a cricket, everything is perfectly designed. You couldn't make a watch to do what a cricket does, but God could. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. But they became futile in their thoughts and in their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Paul, writing to the Romans, is explaining the journey of every person who God gives an awareness to them that he's real because look at everything he made. Look at the stars in the sky. Look at the moon. Look at the ocean. Look at the mountains. My goodness, look at a flower. Look at a cricket. Everything is so intricately and perfectly designed, including you. Isn't it amazing? They can... Take a hair out of your head and they can tell who you are. It's all there. And God put it all together because it just doesn't happen as a coalescence of elements coming together with heat and time over billions of years. Did you ever think about this? The sun and every single star that you look at is a candle. Big giant candle, but it's a candle. There had to be a time it got lit. And there will be a time that it gets put out. The sun is shrinking all the time. Back that off a billion years. Where were we? Boiling. <laughs> Even God's eternal power and Godhead are clearly seen. Be careful of a thankless heart. Because that is the road to destruction according to Romans chapter 1. Not glorifying God as God, not seeing him as God, not recognizing him as God, and suddenly becoming unthankful. That's the beginning of this dissension where God then gives you over to a depraved mind and all these other things that it lists in chapter 1. A cold, unthankful heart may indicate a shallow faith and be the beginning of an ever-darkening descent. I'm not talking about losing your salvation. I'm talking about entering into depression and chains and shackles in your life where you're not going to be fruitful for God because you're not abiding in the vine. In case I'm misunderstood. And then he said to him, the one who came back, the leper, go your way, your faith has made you well. It's interesting, special proclamation on this one guy that the other nine didn't get. I find that curious. These nine seemed to go to Jesus and they got what they wanted and they went and adhered to the law and, and they were good with that. And that was enough for them. But one came back. One came back to give worship and thanks to him. And he had a special pronouncement put on him that the other nine didn't have. Now, if you like to read theologians, you can read volumes and volumes and volumes of people who said the nine that came were those who came and they didn't know Jesus. They just got something from Jesus and ran away. And this is the only guy that really had a relationship with Jesus. It could be, or maybe not. Because those guys had to have faith to go back, didn't they? I don't know. You can argue about that later when you're eating. 
Psalm 51, a couple of passages when David fell with Bathsheba and he was in the midst of his sin and he was coming back to God and he had a real sense that he was a leper and that he needed God's healing. Some of the passages, uh, verses 7, 10, 15 to 17. He says, purge me with hyssop. Isn't it interesting he uses hyssop? Because didn't we just see that in Leviticus? Purge me with hyssop because he believes he's a leper. And I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. You want to know what God wants from you? He wants your heart. Amen. He wants a humble heart where you understand that you're sick and you need a doctor. And Jesus is the only one that's got the cure for what you have. Amen. So what could possibly be my reason not to trust him more? or to worship him louder and be overflowing with thanks? What could possibly be my problem that I'm not more joyful? Am I one of the nine? I don't want to be one of the nine. I want to be one of the, I want to be the 10th. I want to be number 10. Psalm 103 for your meditation. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things. In about five minutes. That's what it means. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. There's a promise for those in the Ukraine. Lord Jesus. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, not like your daddy, and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, amen, nor punished us according to our iniquities, praise God. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field. So he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it's gone. And its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, from everlasting past, everlasting future, on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children. You want to set up a heritage for your kids? Be a godly person. Amen. To such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you, his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you, his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Do you know that a thankful heart needs to be cultivated like a garden? A thankful heart is cultivated. If you have a cold, unfeeling heart, it's because maybe there's not enough manure. 
Maybe you need some stuff dropped on you. Last slide. Cultivating a thankful heart. In 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice always. This is a command. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Amen. Why don't you guys read it with me? Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That is one to commit to memory. Romans 12, 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. And do not be wise in your own opinion. You want to cultivate a thankful heart? Spend some time with some suffering people. Go to a hospital. Feed the homeless. Visit somebody who's just experienced the death of a loved one. You associate with the low, with the meek, with the humble, with people that this world wouldn't have anything to do with. You want to get a thankful heart? You spend time with those people. Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Not, um, not a single syllable. Meditate on these things. Why? Because it's going to generate a thankful heart. A thankful heart is something that's cultivated. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, my worries. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This should be a prayer that we pray all the time. God, what's wrong with me? Let me know what it is so I can get the heck out of it. <laughs> and give me a thankful heart. I want to be one of the ten. Has God been kind to you? Let me hear a common response. Yes. Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> Has Jesus cleansed you? Yes. Are you ready to be one of the ten? Yes. Amen. The challenge today is to be the one of ten to cultivate a thankful heart to be as Jesus would have us be.